we have with us um, from Slovenia Primoš Kraševec, who is a, a sociologist and uh, activist, member of the Workers and Punks University, um, who has written for the first issue on the Slovenian, uh, on the recent uprisings in Slovenia. Um, still missing he is um, our own uh, Mislav Žitko from Zagreb, who is uh, an assistant at the Faculty of Philosophy, um, who has also written for our uh, first issue. Um, he will be joining us hopefully very soon. And um, apart from myself, from the um, editorial board is also Andrea Radak, uh, whom uh, most of you will know, who is a, a veteran a jo a journalist of sorts. And um, well, um, and our reservoir of uh, of uh, professional uh, uh, knowledge uh, internally. So um, to start off, the idea was um, so the idea is um, to have it um, to have a relatively um, informal um, roundtable or discussion. So there will be no um, no um, no extensive monologues. And the subject itself is also quite broadly framed. So it's a question of, oh, here is our missing member. Okay. It's quite broadly framed. So the idea was um, uh, um, Europe, uh, uprisings, and the media. The idea is, um, of course, um, to try to, um, to, try to um, well, critically reflect on um, some of uh, some of the, the current uh, and recent events in uh, Europe, the European Union, its crisis, some of the responses, and the way the media has uh, treated um, both. So I would like then to start with uh, Primus, who comes from uh, uh, Ljubljana, and um, as most of you will have. Uh, um, will know by now, and especially those who have read uh, um, Primus's text in, in the January issue of the Croatian edition of Le Monde um, In Slovenia, politically, things have been quite heated. And um, as a response to, to certain uh, um, well, austerity measures and uh, corruption scandals, um, there was a, a big mo mobilization from below. Um, most of that you will know, but the, the surprising thing uh, has been, for us at least, uh, from a Croatian perspective, to what extent um, critical voices, uh, such as Primus, uh, have gained entrance into the mainstream media. So uh, I would like to um, ask Primus, um, uh, how do you, what do you see, what were the circumstances and, um, and reasons for this uh, sudden opening up of uh, mainstream media to critical uh, voices? Um, in Croatia, the situation is uh, decisively different from that. No, I don't. Okay. Um, well, uh, we still don't know uh, the reasons. And in the beginning, when um, in the beginning when these uh, critical voices, radical perspectives were beginning to to get published in mainstream media, and I mean the most mainstream media, like. Um, uh, one of the two biggest uh, national dailies, Neonic, uh, it was actually on their initiative. So uh, it wasn't that activists were trying, I mean, we were trying to push uh, uh, radical or critical content into the media, but to no avail until at some moment suddenly the um, uh, um, uh, major newspapers, uh, uh, public uh, public uh, radio station, public TV station, and so on, started to actively uh, uh, ask for uh, for this type of of content. So, um, but they never gave the reason. So we can only speculate. Uh, I can say that uh, it took it took the uninstitutional or radical left in in Slovenia this this sudden openness by the media, uh, by the mainstream media, it uh, caught them quite by uh, surprise. So. But there were uh, attempts to to hastily adjust to because we were so used to media ignorance, we didn't really have a, a media strategy. We didn't have a developed media strategy, so there were attempts to to hastily uh, uh, create something, some sort of of media strategy. And this strategy, well, strategy it was very improvised and it had to be done in a hurry. Was just to try to use this window of opportunity and just to get as much critical views. Uh, 
uh, uh, critical interpretations of the crisis of the of the political situation also uh, explicit criticism of uh, capitalist mode of production as such to get as much of this content uh, published in this window of opportunity because we knew or at least had a hunch that this window of opportunity uh, will be uh, rather short um, and, and we managed that. Uh, we managed that to quite some extent, especially in December and January. So in time when uh, political situation was the most, uh, the most shaky, the most, uh, um, the most unstable. But it all began to change after the toppling of the Yansha government and with the installation of the new governor. So if I'm to speculate retroactively, this is this would be my educated guess. The sudden openness was just to uh, radicalize the discourse to uh, to speed up the the fall of Yansha and now that the left liberal government is again in power most of the uh, uh, most of the national media most of the public media which are more or less pro liberal uh, stopped being interesting in radical context so I think in some way um, radical left was instrumentalized in this process but this is not uh, I don't mean it as a, in a totally defeatist way I, uh, it, we also gained something from it so we managed to push uh, this content which was previously at least for 20-25 years completely unavailable so for example interviews with Marxist economists and, and uh, so on. But we also quickly realized the, the limitations of this strategy. Uh, for example, to just push Marxist or radical left or uh, critical left, uh, left-wing content into the media because it just uh, gets lost in the, in the, in the contest. So as much as we can congratulate ourselves if we jump from having nothing in the mainstream newspapers to having, I don't know, 5% of, of the content of the mainstream newspapers, it still gets dominated by liberal or, uh, in the best case, Keynesian interpretations of the crisis of the economic and political uh, situation. So we still need to, uh, regarding uh, long-term media strategy, we still have to figure a lot of things out, for example, how to uh, establish hegemony, left-wing hegemony uh, in Gramsci's terms and not just be uh, be satisfied too quickly, like we managed to publish something and uh, be too self-congratulatory. Maybe one follow-up question. You have written critically precisely about, uh, um, about this, that despite this sudden opening up, and I was in Ljubljana recently and I saw a special issue of Mladina, which mm -hmm. is quite an influential um, publication, um, exclusively devoted, entirely devoted to um, left alternatives and critical perspectives. So you know, on the one hand, it still seems, um, so you have said that there may, be, uh, may have been an element of opportunism from the left mm -hmm. liberal um, uh, media sphere uh, involved in toppling Yansha and so on. But um, it's in, for one, uh, for, from a creation perspective still, I would say it is still uh, an impressive uh, um, an impressive uh, reconfiguration of, of what is uh, allowed into, uh, of the very parameters of what is allowed into mainstream discourse. But on the other hand, you have emphasized that as a long-term strategy, um, the left is still missing in Croatia, uh, in, pardon, in Slovenia, um, their own media. So uh, something to build on um, in, uh, in terms of consistency and not be uh, so uh, dependent on on interest, which is always, um, uh, to say the least, uh, precarious, or um, depends on 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 the current events, on, on the on the production of events or spectacles and so on. Yeah, uh, exactly, exactly. Uh, I agree completely. I think what left is still missing, and I think we shouldn't be satisfied so quickly. Uh, we managed to get foot in the door, probably, of uh, mainstream media to get some, some, however, a small share of the content to have it reserved for us. Uh, but it's it's still too small, and we shouldn't be satisfied too quickly. Uh, but we can still use this uh, this foot in the door, so to speak, uh, as a lever to to try to establish some hegemony. And how to do this? I think it's by by a combination of establishing your own media, but also for struggling for uh, um, for reorganization, uh, reorientation, both on the formal level and the level of organization. How the newspaper or a radio station function? How is organized? 
organized, what are working conditions uh, within it, what are the, uh, the editorial standards and so on, and on the level of content. So, so also to struggle within the existing media institutions, but also to, to establish your own. There, there are actually plans, but there are still in very embryonal phase uh, for, a, for a new explicitly left-wing newspapers. As regards Mladina, uh, as some of you probably know, it used to be in the 80s, it used to be a, a newspaper of the, of the democratic opposition, so to speak, the, the young communist, the, but also the nationalist Janša wrote, wrote its first column and, uh, columns as a journalist for Mladina. In the, in the 80s it was a voice of the uh, 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 let's say anti-socialist uh, opposition um, and then through years it developed into a left liberal uh, newspaper and um, like, like most uh, mainstream newspapers it also depends perhaps not explicitly but it depends on uh, because it does not have uh, it does not have its autonomous uh, production it, it cannot establish an autonomous production of political discourse or political topics ideas it depends on support on this or that party so Mladina to, to speak concretely is is really desperate for a new a new left wing party to emerge so it would have somebody to depend on because at the moment uh, liberal democrats are uh, have completely disintegrated. Positive Slovenia is too corrupt and too publicly discredited for left liberals uh, to uh, to support it. So now Mladina, Mladina is desperate for a uh, new, new left-wing party to emerge, so it would have somebody to lean on, to, uh, to support and to depend on. But uh, to their dismay, it might turn out that this new party will be socialist, so it will be too left-wing. So I think at this moment, Mladina's support will end. One uh, last question for, for uh, pretty much for now, and then before uh, switching to uh, uh, Mislav. Um, from a Croatian perspective, it is still, um, it may seem, or at least to me it seems, that, um, that this sudden opening up in a broader context is very much, um, is very much tied to a, a general disappoint and, uh, disappointment in, in the European integration process. As, as, the, as that which has been for, for most of post-socialist countries like uh, the absolute and unquestioned um, trajectory and, and their, their uh, version of, of this uh, end of history narrative. One we ent once we enter the European Union, then we have a European normalization, we have a generalization of welfare, we have social justice, we have uh, rule of law and so on and so on. Um, Slovenia's trajectory in that respect has of course been um, very specific, uh, unlike um, Croatia and um, most other post-socialist countries, it uh, initially it uh, um, did not fall into a deep transitional uh, depression, quite the opposite. It developed, um, it seemed to be um, one of the uh, uh, unquestionable winners of the transition process. But um, after, two, uh, after um, entering the European Union and especially the Eurozone, all of this seems to have been lost very rapidly. And, uh, um, so it seems now that uh, um, the bad side of, of history, that one uh, <laughs> of the transition, uh, has caught up uh, with, with Slovenia even. And uh, do you think that, uh, that this, that this maybe this crisis of legitimacy of this narrative of the European integration, that this is um, um, how, to, how should I say the underlying uh, uh, deeper, uh, deeper structural reason for this, uh, for this uh, new uh, emergence of interest in? In, in even, in, even in, in theoretical and uh, political positions that question the, the very project as such. Yeah, uh, I, I agree. Um, uh, definitely the, the dominant narratives of the last 20th century are, are definitely in crisis. They definitely don't have the explanatory power anymore because they're so obviously empirically been, been proven wrong. And it's not just the, the, the story of European integration, it's a big part of it. But there's also a story of a, of a special Slovenian way before the European integration. So about the using in using the uh, 
uh, the specificity of uh, Slovenian national character, such as uh, such as industrialness, uh, uh, Protestant <laughs> ethics, and and so on, to uh, to to bridge this gap towards uh, developed European economies and and stay there without any crisis, without any turmoils, and uh, you, in the European integration was basically seen uh, um, as a as cherry on the top. So we are already doing well, but we might, we have to do this. Um, European integration, uh, as, as opposed to Croatia, wasn't used uh, so much in this perspective of normalization after the war, after the dictatorial regime, and so on, so on. Um, but uh, more, more like uh, this, uh, this final step, this final institutionalization of something that we are supposed to know, unlike our uh, um, less, less developed uh, Balkan neighbors, that we are already uh, capable of. Now, now both of these narratives uh, uh, hit a dead end, both ideologically and empirically. So the same, the same policies that used to uh, guarantee success uh, now, now uh, or were supposed to guarantee success are now prolonging the, the recession. So, so you have this uh, rare opportunity of a mismatch between uh, uh, so, uh, the gap between ideology and empirical reality that is so big that actually endangers the, the ruling ideology. And I agree, this, this was also the factor. Um, it, took, um, it took at least uh, half a year or maybe almost a year for, let's say, for institutions like uh, 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 Faculty of Economy to recover fr from this shock and, and to try, try, to, um, uh, try to produce or to offer supplementary ideologies. Like, for example, now, now, now they, they wipe the dust off the story about knowledge society. Now, now it's, uh, once again, it's all about knowledge. Maybe we are hard, hard work working and industrial, but we don't have enough knowledge. So now, uh, but these are, these are uh, really obviously desperate attempts to, to provide a new, uh, new uh, dominant ideology. So this, this might also be a reason why this openness still lingers on, although the political, strictly political conditions for it are gone. You have said um, the, rate, the transition narrative has been proven wrong, and that, of course, um, uh, if you look at um, Croatia's trajectory of the past 20 years, and especially now, or on, even on the European scale, uh, austerity pol policies. If, if we can say anything about this, then it, it is that um, in relation to the proclaimed goals of, of aust uh, austerity politics, um, well, it has been uh, thoroughly proven wrong. But unlike Slovenia, where now uh, things uh, are opening up to, to uh, alternative perspectives, in Croatia we still have um, there's a situation where um, in, the, in the media or in the public sphere generally um, it is um, left voices are more or less uh, um, are, um, are limited to the cultural field, to, to uh, humanist uh, sciences, to, to uh, art and, uh, and, uh, and such matters, whilst uh, um, economic matters are uh, emphatically still under the monopoly of, of mainstream opinion. And we even have, of course, this very f uh, famous uh, uh, columnist here in Croatia, whose uh, 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 very weekly column is called um, uh, Economics to the Economists. So, um, Mislav, you have uh, written on, uh, both on, uh, on the question of this uh, debilitating self-limitation uh, of, of the left, onto uh, the cultural field and also on on the role of uh, of, uh, the, uh, of of the figure of the of the economic expert uh, uh, as an uh, well as a very powerful um, institutional and one would say even ideological um, <coughs> ideological um, instance <coughs> of reproduction of of uh, uh, dominant uh, uh, economic practices so maybe you can you would like to say something more about that well, since you put it like that, um, <laughs> to be honest, I cannot actually tell whether um, the media coverage of the crisis has improved uh, or um, has deteriorated in, in recent years. And um, if, if, if you want to put it in a larger historical framework, uh, I think um, going back to the 90s, uh, we can definitely see that uh, certain dominant themes, certain stories have developed uh, uh, in the media and in the public. 
and that these stories were, um, when you look at it analytically, uh, these stories were shaped, they were developed, uh, underpinned by a dominant uh, orthodox uh, discourse uh, um, in the economic field. So it, they were shaped by neoclassical theory, to be more precise. And so in this story um, in which, you know, rising tide lifts all boats and uh, uh, wealth trickles down and stuff like that, it was very, of course, difficult to situate any kind of critical voice. And uh, I think that the point that has to be made in, 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 that, uh, in that sense is that um, to the extent that you know, you know the, the representation of the crisis and the representation of of the economic phenomena is not satisfactory, I think it's not just the fault of media itself. It is also uh, related or correlated to uh, the dynamics of the academic field on one hand and the, the dynamics of the of the civil society, of the overall civil society on the other. So you see. Um, to understand what is going on and uh, to understand how this type of representation comes up and how it is it, how it is developed, you need to see other fields or other let's call them professionals to to whom uh, me media uh, likes to talk to or uh, um, basically you have to do an empirical investigation and and see uh, the frequency of. Uh, people who are uh, uh, the frequent of, of appearance of certain type of experts. And then you can uh, in turn understand why we have such a very narrow uh, understanding of the crisis, why it has, it, why it has been represented, represented in the way it, it has been uh, over the last, say, four or five years, and why even the most dramatic events, such as, uh, such as the crisis of the household, are still uh, are, are, are still in in uh, in more than one way uh, 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 um, portrayed in this very uh, um, deterministic sense in terms of uh, that on one hand we have an economic field which has its own inherent laws and on the other hand we have uh, basically irrational consumers or irrational households that did not you know, understand the risks uh, that were uh, obviously present, and even if they did, they did not uh, um, uh, act accordingly. So uh, I, I wouldn't put so much pressure on the media itself, on the newspapers uh, uh, themselves, and, or, or, or on electronic media. Um, what, what I think uh, needs to be seen is uh, what, what, what I think the basic lesson of, of the whole transition period is, uh, is this interplay between uh, uh, academic field and um, uh, civil society and the media. And from that we can you know, develop an understanding why uh, certain economic uh, phenomena or certain economic concepts are presented uh, um, in mostly in, in, in this very orthodox way and why we had not uh, why, why we haven't had a, a much wider uh, uh, debate about the causes of the crisis and the possible solutions. Um, even, even when we do have some kind of dissenting voices, uh, let's say these are mostly um, Keynesian economists or maybe left liberal uh, uh, <laughs> policy analysts, uh, they are brought to the front, they are, they are being represented as experts. So you see, uh, throughout this period, the, the, I think that we can observe a general tendency uh, of depolitization. So framing uh, one discourse, expert discourse, as something that we can rely on. And uh, uh, to that extent, um, we can see uh, that most of the reporters uh, and most of the media coverage likes to talk about you know, experts and, their, and the knowledge they are producing. And, uh, and you know, they, they like to rely on, on these, these types of analysis without questioning uh, the, the polit their political stance. I mean, the political stance of, of these so-called experts. Because uh, when you look, uh, when you kind of uh, move away from, from the, uh, from the uh, uh, media and, and the whole question of representation, and when you look uh, at the academic field and, and the whole issue of knowledge production, you will see that these people uh, 
even even in Croatia disagree on a number of things. And when you look at uh, you know, like on the level of, of Europe or European Union, I mean, economists disagree all the time. Uh, nobody has precise definition of how economy works. We, we can only pretend uh, in a in a uh, in a uh, limited time frame. And of course, uh, uh, perhaps one of the one of the issues here that also needs to be mentioned, which has played an important role to this again very narrow discourse about the economy and um, uh, by extension very narrow uh, representation of the crisis. Uh, the problem is, of course, for Croatia, 1990s, and you know this whole division between nationalists on one hand and all others. Uh, 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 on the other. Uh, and one of the side effects of this division that was really dominant in the 1990s was uh, inability to speak about economic issues. Uh, because to, uh, uh, you know, uh, the only opposition to nationalist, nationalist discourse was this um, um, left liberal framing uh, uh, of society, which counts on, you know, economy being some kind, some sort of, as the old physiocrats would say, social physics. So when you come to the, to the question about how economy works and what are, what are the basic concepts that need to be uh, understood in, in that regard, uh, we'll leave that to the experts. Because you know, uh, we don't have the abilities, we don't have the knowledge uh, to make uh, any kind of critical questions, let alone have, have uh, decent answers. And so, yeah, uh, uh, it, it is not surprising that um, that the, the crisis and the, 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 the whole debate about austerity uh, politics in Croatia, and I would say in other countries, I, I've just returned from Serbia and things are pretty much the same. I have uh, uh, an issue of um, Serbian mainstream journal, Nin, which plays on the same, uh, on the same uh, metaphors of uh, you know, inefficient state and uh, efficient private sector, which will, you know, uh, in time uh, generate investment and growth and so on and so forth. Uh, so, uh, I, for both of these countries that had the experience of war and that had ex uh, an experience of, uh, you know, really dominant nationalist discourse, one of the side effects, I think this needs to be uh, taken into account, one of the side effects is, an, is, is some sort of inability to speak about, you know, very important economic issues. Uh, so there is also um, a need to kind of connect um, you know, the basic dynamics of, of the political field with what happens on, uh, uh, in the media and how media operates. So to cut the long story short, I think that uh, uh, you know, media representation is just an end product of many, many social forces. And it is, I think, impossible to, uh, to speak uh, 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 about media in is isolation, you see. Uh, the, the, the media field and you know, the various journals, uh, newspapers, uh, and ele electronic media as well, they are all, they are all in a way mirroring what is happening uh, outside. Uh, of course, they have the ability, generally, theoretically, they have the ability to produce or to, uh, to kind of performatively uh, uh, set some kind of uh, series of events that could change you know, public opinion about uh, about certain problems, but uh, given the given their past, given how they were um, uh, basically instrumentalized in in the in the early 1990s, and uh, how this fact alone debilitated their their ability to learn. Uh, it is not surprisingly that they are basically mediating the dynamics uh, and mirroring the dynamics of uh, political field, academic field, and you know, the, the overall civil society. Uh, to, thank you, to, but to pick up on, on certain, uh, certain issues you touched on, um, now um, I very much agree that it's, um, one has to look at the 90s, at, at the way how, how the basic ideological camps have been set up then, yeah. and the long consequences of that. <coughs> and that, that is, to a certain extent, of course, also the origin of this uncritical acceptance of, of, of a certain technocratic ideology um, of expert discourses. Mm -hmm. where the idea was, um, okay, we have um, the economy as, as such is 
as you precisely said, a question of social physics with very clear laws, and, and this um, uh, this is something um, beyond beyond the realm of, of, of politics. Of course, anyone remotely familiar with uh, economic history, with, uh, that the, uh, uh, with the history of economic theory, knows that uh, even, um, that of course there is no such thing as one uh, expert discourse as one economic theory, but there are, there are uh, uh, many contesting uh, approaches in parallel lines. Uh, so yes, this, this of course had the effect of the depolitization, but uh, uh, let, let's then skip, um, uh, skip uh, things to uh, maybe more recent occurrences. Um, despite the fact that, um, of course, much of, of, of the left, as you have uh, repeatedly written, on this uh, critically has resigned itself to not touch, basically mm. bought into that this, this division right. of, of labor, uh, right. accepted that, that the economy is, is something um, outside of the realms of politics or even of, of ideological interest. Recently, there have been uh, there have been post-Keynesians, as you have mentioned, who have been there but relatively marginalized uh, in right. the public discourse. But also other other people and act or the activist left, even people from the academic mm. field, um, have well. Um, uh, started to uh, slowly uh, pick up on, on uh, that, that, that these fundamental divisions mm -hmm. are in themselves politically uh, and ideologically problematic. So the, the interesting thing then uh, is that what we can call basically this dominance of supply side economics uh, uh, in um, uh, more or less still unquestioned in, in, um, in, in the uh, mainstream discourse and also in, in media representations the class aspect or the political dimension of this seems to have, uh, seems to have for a very long time um, been um, uh, to, to have been um, invisible to modern concepts. But as of recently, I would uh, say, and uh, since uh, we, there is some sort of forming some sort of uh, left uh, uh, left opinion mm -hmm. criticizing this, we have seen um, in the media there are. Uh, dailies, which have basically uh, aggressively taken up uh, that very political and class aspect of, of such politics. So, so supply side economics are not only uh, no longer uh, advocated uh, from a strictly technocratic perspective, but there is a really uh, an, an aggressively, a tabloid aggressively, I would say, Thatcherite in its, in its rhetorics, mm. um, uh, aggressive uh, class potential. Do you see this? Uh, do you see this, um, this sharpening of, of, uh, of, of fault lines or of, of confrontation lines? Um, for one, how do you uh, explain it uh, broadly, and what do you uh, do you see? Um, uh, where do you see the, cha the chances and, and, and dangers mm -hmm. for, uh, uh, for the left in this? Country? Yeah. Uh, well, I think that we can draw this line between you know the business press that has ex existed in Croatia, I'm sure in other countries, uh, other post post socialist countries as well, and you know the regular mainstream media. And I would I I've been reading you know business pre press for years. And they were, to um, quite an extent, very conscious about their agenda. I mean, they, they knew what were what they were talking about, and they knew who, who were, uh, uh, um, you know, they, they knew what their their audience expects from them. Uh, so the the business press in the times of crisis and in the in the pre-crisis times, um, they were basically pursuing, you know, consciously pursuing the the usual um, um, Washington consensus agenda, um, celebrating privatization, celebrating financial liberalization, you know, uh, uh, capitalization of, of the pension funds, and so on and so on and so forth. And uh, uh, of course, um, uh, as the as this tension between the tension that, that I was referring to, which was dominant in the 1990s, as this, this tension between nationalist nationalist discourse and all all, all other discourse, ma mainly left liberal discourse, melted away or uh, or didn't didn't provide as much you know political juice as it used to. Uh, the other questions, uh, other questions which were more uh, more related to to Croatian, uh, uh, you know, in, in Croatian inherent economic dynamic, uh, they 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 you know became more prominent, and certain commentators and analysts, uh, 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 well, they tried to uh, to say something about them, uh, and uh, the fact is that. Uh, what they actually did is precisely what I explained earlier. They they were I don't 
I don't feel uh, that they have any kind of deep knowledge or, under, uh, or any kind of deep understanding of neoclassical arguments. So they could not, uh, they are representing this discourse, but they don't see the whole picture. You know? So they cannot uh, you know, uh, drive, uh, drive the, the, their arguments to its logical conclusion or, 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 or show the foundations of, of this particular argument, say, in favor of privatization or in favor of, I don't know, uh, capitalization of, of the pension funds. Uh, what they do is they, I think, again, uh, they are mimicking what they, why they, you know, they are mimicking uh, their role models. Uh, I think in the in the Western countries. So probably reading the Economist or some other uh, prestigious news newspapers. And if Economist says, you know, uh, the austerity measures are good, you know, they should, there is a, a potential uh, for a, an expansionary austerity program. Then uh, our local commentators ignorant as they are, uh, will probably reproduce the same discourse. So I, there are very few, I, I, I think that there are very few commentators, very few analysts uh, who, are, who are doing the reading for themselves and who are, ab who are able to uh, um, kind of analyze uh, uh, a certain ec economic problem or a certain economic political situation uh, from, from a, a, a coherent uh, liberal or neoclassical position. Most of most of these people, um, uh, well, they had jobs before, you know, in the former Yugoslavia, and were, I think, basically doing the same the same type uh, the, sa the same the same type of work. So, um, if there is a uh, kind of more, if, if one can see uh, a, a kind of a rising tension between what would be called, you know, broadly left discourse. Uh, and on one hand, and um, and like neoclassical or liberal discourse on the other, it is I think just an effect of the severity of the crisis. I mean, the crisis in Croatia and uh, and in other uh, countries in the region is so deep that you cannot miss it. And it, it at this at this point where you have um, almost uh, 300 people unemployed and uh, the, you know, the the situation is deteriorating. Uh, each day, uh, it is very difficult to produce a discourse that would hide these effects because they are clearly visible and and uh, they need to be um, confronted in a in, in a clear and definite manner. And so, what the, what what uh, uh, you know the the the, the most uh, most well known commentators and, and uh, most prominent analysts, what they are doing, I mean, when, when we talk about you know, Croatian <coughs> media field, uh, I think that they are basically <coughs> mimicking, uh, mimicking uh, uh, the, 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 the articles and the opinion of the, of the um, uh, prominent, uh, uh, prominent uh, like Western magazines such as Economist or the Financial Times. And if in, in, in certain periods or at certain points, there are you know, opposing voices. If there are some interviews with, with, uh, with you know, I know post-Keynesian economists or some you know, uh, old, uh, old, uh, old school uh, uh, socialist economist, I think that, that this is uh, this is not uh, uh, it, it doesn't have you know the desired effect from the from the uh, from the uh, from the viewpoint of the left. Uh, because I think this is only, um, in a way, um, uh, playing on the card of pl plurality of opinions. Uh, so basically, every once in a while, you will have an interview with, I don't know, Joža Mentinger from, from Slovenia, and you'll have this four or five very you know, irrelevant questions, and he will answer it to the best of his ability, and so on and so forth. But th that's, that's basically it. Uh, you see, uh, and, and this is especially true if we take into account a public, uh, what it's supposed to be uh, public media and, and, uh, and their role and their function. See, uh, this type of media, which should, ha which should have a public interest at heart, did not produce space for debating this very important and in, in, in this point of time, very crucial issues. And so they have failed, I think, completely in providing the, the public the right uh, the, the right information and and uh, and also uh, in in kind of generating a, a space where you could 
where you could kind of explore and uh, and you could educate uh, uh, the public about the issues that were here all along, but for the reasons that I've mentioned uh, uh, earlier, from the 1990s onward, were not uh, were not part of the, of the debate. So uh, I think that in terms of prospects. Uh, the only way, the only way to kind of uh, influence the public opinion, and the only way to transform uh, the media field is for the left is uh, basically to do it on its own. And yeah, of course, Le Monde is uh, is an is an excellent example of that. And we have a, a couple of more, a couple of more uh, um, uh, uh, newspapers uh, uh, that are. You know, basically proceeding in, in, in the same direction. This would be a commercial if we had like many, many uh, uh, newspapers like that, but since it is the only one, I mean, it's kind of obvious, so I don't, I don't need to hide it. Uh, so I think that the only way to transform this uh, 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 media field uh, and the only way to improve journalism is for the left to do it on its own. And that means not just, uh, um, you know, uh, starting up n newspapers which uh, which will be uh, consciously devoted to debating things and to to critical examination but it also as I said earlier it also <coughs> involves and this is I think also critical it in, it, it involves transformation of the academic field and it and it also involves uh, 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 major changes in the way civil society operates because uh, if nothing changes in these two fields, then uh, uh, journalists and reporters who are willing and able to, to, to work on certain topics that, you know, that need critical attention, that, you know, that, that public need to, to, to work on the questions that public uh, 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 needs to be acquainted with, uh, uh, they will be unable to, to fulfill that, that task because they will have nobody, nobody to talk to and they will have no sources uh, of information on which on which they, they could rely, and and in the end we will have this very um, very monotone and and, and narrow uh, representation not just of the crisis but uh, but of the you know economic problems in general just as we uh, uh, just as we we have seen up to up to the point of the crisis. Um, despite everything uh, you have said so far about. Um, caution one should have towards um, expert discourse. Uh, let me still move your specific uh, expertise a bit more. This, uh, because you have mentioned 300,000 unemployed, uh, so yeah. a rate of almost 20%. And now, of course, um, regardless of whether it's mimicry or true ideological, I don't know, um, I don't know fanaticism on the part of the people um, putting forward these arguments, uh, one of the uh, uh, if, if, if uh, so, you have said uh, the crisis, the severity of the crisis makes things um, visible and so uh, necessarily so fault lines have to de uh, uh, develop. But um, I would uh, that in part, of course, that is true. But what is even more astonishing that they are not developing to the full extent that one would have expected, uh, maybe. So, um, despite this deep crisis of the European Union. Despite the, the severity of the crisis here in Croatia, the dominant the dominant uh, reflex you get, the dominant response you get uh, when you say that the model is not working, we have uh, 300,000 unemployed and so forth, is yes, that is true. But uh, the, the true cause of the problems uh, is not uh, capitalism. It's not uh, uh, um, the uh, uh, transitional process and the reforms that have been done. But precisely the opposite. Uh, uh, the cause of the problems is uh, that these reforms have been insufficiently thorough. So we need to deepen pro-market uh, pro reforms. So it is used as as, a, as an argument absorbed into uh, into um, into a continuation uh, of of, uh, poli uh, of policies that have until now been uh, uh, yes um, so and an additional of course the, the and then uh, uh, often this results then in this spectacular argument saying that um, that uh, we cannot talk about the crisis of capitalism because there is no such thing as capitalism in Croatia because uh, uh, capitalism is supposed to be this and that, this and that. So this is a very popular figure. So uh, before, uh, before, uh, yeah. okay. Uh, first of all, let me just point out that uh, uh, I, I don't mean that the the commentators and the analysts in the mainstream media are not ideologues. It's 
just that they're not very good. Uh, th that was my point. Uh, second of all, um, uh, I think that at this point uh, Croatia uh, is still not part of the European Union. So to some extent this enables a great maneuvering space in terms of, of representation of the crisis and in terms of, of course, uh, explanation of the underlying causes of the crisis. Uh, I think that as soon as uh, Croatia enters uh, European Union, things will change in, in, that, in, in, that, in that effect. Uh, because, um, and that, m that might just be the most important change. Because uh, uh, many people uh, you know, seem to forget that this macroeconomic straitjacket uh, has been here with us for a number of years, ever since. A deep division between those countries that are in, that are that are part of the Euro European Union and the Eurozone, and the other countries which are uh, which are left outside. And uh, the division basically consists in the fact that uh, the countries in the Eurozone and, the, to a lesser extent, in the Euro European Union are st strategically important. So, by the way of, of example. Uh, nothing took place uh, in, in Greece that didn't happen before in Latvia. But the point is that you know Latvia is far away and it's, it's not it's not a part of the of the of the monetary union, and so and therefore it is it is uh, not stru structurally important, and of, and that uh, that is uh, that is why so much uh, uh, attention has been put on Greece and, and um, you know, you get basically very little uh, coverage about countries like Latvia or Hungary and so on and so forth. So uh, uh, in, in, I, to that extent, I think that um, uh, by entering European Union, uh, Croatia will um, uh, finally ha will have to face up the, the real rules of the game. And, uh, uh, you know, the, um, because for um, uh, less developed countries within the European uh, European Union, uh, you know, uh, you know, the European Commission will, will cut them no slack in terms of uh, master criteria and all other and all other uh, 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 points that need to be uh, satisfied in, in order to function as a proper member. So I think, uh, uh, you know, uh, the economic contraction and the econ general economic situation will become much much more. Uh, Severe ones when you have to really uh, um, face the the the, uh, the the all the criteria from the European Commission, and that will, I think, in turn uh, uh, genera, uh, generate a uh, kind of a, a sober senses about about um, um, uh, whether there is capitalism or in Croatia or not. The story about you know feudalism or some sort of uh, quasi-socialism that, that survived uh, uh, 1989, uh, I think that, that that is a story that could um, be you know, presented as plausible maybe in the 1990s by certain members of the civil society, who, you know, civil society liberals who were not kind of happy that we don't have what they call you know, you know, pure market here and stuff like that. But, uh, I think that the, the crisis uh, of the Eurozone itself generated uh, uh, um, some, some, some sort of evidence that we are, we are not, uh, um, in reality, we are not dealing with a capitalism, but a, a varieties of capitalism. And uh, given the divergence between uh, given the divergence between the core and periphery, uh, what we, and I think this is also to, to some extent now even present in, in, the, in, the, uh, in the media coverage. Uh, what we actually uh, see is basically a lot of different varieties of capitalism strategically interacting. And uh, of course, you will not, you will not find it uh, uh, in, in, this for, in, this type, in this formulation in the mainstream media. What you will find uh, is basically, uh, again, metaphors about lazy Greeks and, and efficient Germans, but that is also just uh, just a derivation of the of the basic fact that uh, Europe is divided in half. Uh, it is divided between you know the core countries that are that are uh, the, which are you know the most important in generating this uh, eurozone dynamics and and the periphery, which basically uh, is uh, left to take all the consequences of of this type 
of, of neo mercantilist dyna dynamics. Uh, so the 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 the, um, the Croatian entrance into European Union will change uh, will change I think the way that the mainstream media uh, and you know all, all the all the uh, like high quality journalists uh, see Croatian position and uh, you know once when you enter European Union you cannot possibly argue that you know you are not part of the capitalist system since you know you are now in the in 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 the monetary union this is official you have you know uh, 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 quite specific legal framework and so on and so forth this is what this is what uh, unfortunately uh, uh, in the main in the mainstream discourse uh, is the, the like the most important evidence all the all the all the indicators about the suffering of the population are usually not enough but when you ha have like a legal framework and certain agreements that the country has signed and so on and so forth that is like evidence thank you Mislav. so for the last 20 minutes let us return to the question of, uh, of the uh, media itself and the equivalent one could argue the equivalent of expert discourse uh, in the broader sense in the journalistic field as such is a certain emphasis on the notion of professionalism. And professionalism often, and this is, uh, maybe, um, it often implies, and this may be you know, a provocative thesis, but one you have yourself put forward, that, uh, that it is often um, a form of self, of ideological and political self-censorship. It, it implies that we take one opinion and the other, and that uh, the end result has to be a sort of uh, quasi-neutrality one that that, uh, that the true professional journalist is, is one that does not transcend the, um, the limits of what is considered to be some sort of respectable opinion and that um, the true um, uh, professional is basically beyond politics. Now we have seen that even in terms of um, expert discourse and economic theory and so on there is no such position as um, as uh, outside of politics, outside of uh, political interest. And uh, we could uh, m much argue um, the same for the journalistic field, or at least the, we, the people who do, who do this particular uh, newspaper, believe that this is not a contradiction. To have serious and responsible journalism is not a con in contradiction with uh, making explicit one's, uh, uh, one's uh, political uh, uh, positions and intentions. So, if you would like to, to talk a bit about that, and especially in relation to your uh, rich experience with uh, with uh, with mainstream media and also not so mainstream uh, mainstream media, and how you see this in, in this context. Okay. Um, evo ja ću govoriti kao jedna veteranka ipak radi na Hrvatskom, <laughs> pa ako će trebati radi naših gostiju da stipe ne, neki sažetak prevede, vi samo recite. Um, uh, u principu um, uh, ta ideologija profesionalizma koje su novinari često zarobljenici, upravo je o tome i pisao kolega Postnikov sad za zadnji broj Up and Undergrounda, smatra se naime da upravo pojačavanjem tih profesionalnih standarda uh, se može pomoći novinarskoj profesiji i samim medijima da se oni reformiraju iznutra. Uh, međutim, ne samo da moje iskustvo govori potpuno suprotno, nego su to pokazali i nekakvi ovoga, medijski teoretičari. Uh, profesionalno novinarstvo prije svega nije jedna transhistorijska pojava, kako se ona doživljava, nego je nastalo u točno određenom trenutku, kada je to bilo izdavačima, novinskim izdavačima vrlo oportuno, pa se mi nadamo da će u jednom trenutku biti transformirano, ako već neće nestati, ali u svakom slučaju da može doći tu do nekih promjena. U svakom slučaju, mnoge se stvari tu uzimaju zdravo za gotovo, pa u stvari izgleda da je paradoksalno, ali to profesionalno novinarstvo u stvari potiče depolitizaciju novinarstva. Depolitizacija je u stvari opća pojava, jel? ali se ona i na specifičan način ovdje manifestira. Dakle, vi koliko god da trčite za pojedinim političarima, koliko god se bavite ono što nas par kolega naziva dvorskim novinarstvom, u 
isto vrijeme nikada se nećete baviti sistemskim uzrocima, nikada se nećete baviti dubljom kritičkom analizom, nego ćete time samo reproducirati jedan model gdje postoje kao pojedinačna zastranjenja koja treba ispraviti i onda će i ona su ostaci bilo ovakvog nekakvog socijalističkog nasljeđa, mentaliteta ili ne znam, južnjačkoj ili već bilo kojeg. Dakle, to samo treba ispraviti i sve će biti u redu. Razmišljajući malo o tome što bi se danas moglo o tome reći, ja sam pobrojala nekoliko stvari koje su možda manje očigledne. Naime, zna se da u redakcijama danas nema nikakve unutarnje demokracije, da redakcije ne odlučuju niti o sadržaju, niti o svojim radnopravnim odnosima, o vlasničkima, da ne pričamo o izboru urednika, isto tako. Na tome se pokušava i nešto napraviti u sklopu medijske reforme. Međutim, htjela sam se i pozabaviti nekakvim stvarima koje su manje možda poznate, a koje su isto tako sastavni dio te ideologije profesionalizma. U redakcijama, naime, osim što postoje vrlo čvrste te hierarhijske strukture, gdje postoji prava piramida na vrhu sa urednikom, pa sa izvršnim urednicima, kolumnistima i na kraju velikim brojem najamnih radnika, računa se negdje da na jednog zaposlenog novinara dolazi 20 do 30 honoraraca, koji su krajnje potplaćeni. Postoji i tako i konkurencija i kompeticija kroz te različite radnike, radnopravne odnose i isto tako pod izlikom pluralizma. Druga stvar koja je vrlo zanimljiva i kojom bi se vrijedilo možda i šire pozabaviti je upravo uloga kolumnista o kojem je nešto sad i Mislav rekao. Kolumnisti naime imaju specifičan zadatak, da to tako nazovem u pojedinim redakcijama. Osim što su oni transmisija, često direktno želja izdavača, ili urednika, oni imaju još jednu vabeću poziciju sa svojim slikom, sa svojim istaknutim imenom, istaknutom pozicijom. Dakle, oni su projekcija želje svakog novinara koji želi uspjeti njegove karijere. Osim toga, postoji isto tako i politika fotografije u skolom niste, politika fotografije uopće u novinama. Ne samo da ima, naravno, da su prevladavajući muški portreti, portreti političara, niti da bi trebalo poraditi samo na tome da žene uđu u nekakvu kvotu, nego vi ćete prije svega primijetiti da u novinama nedostaju fotografije kolektiva, pogotovo ako je kolektiv u nekakvoj akciji. To se uglavnom izbjegava. Ako imate takvu fotografiju, ona će uredničkom opremom biti tako prezentirana da odmah imate strah od nastupanja mase, naroda, čega god bilo. Isto tako, vrlo je primjetna rodna podjela tema. Žene će se baviti socijalnim politikama, ženskim pravima itd. To su uvijek drugorazredne teme. Postoji još jedna zanimljiva stvar koja isto tako je primjetna kod profesionalnih medija, a uzima se zdravo za gotovo, to je rubriciranje novina, pogotovo mozaične rubrike. Pod mozaične rubrike možete podvesti sve one takozvane škakljive teme koje nemaju pravo plasmana na prednje stranice. Vi ste na taj način informirali čitatelje, pokrili ste tu formu, međutim stvarno nema prostora da se time bavite na ozbiljan način. To su recimo neke od strategija kako funkcioniraju redakcije. No, na najbolji da nastavimo na hrvatskom, pošto će odgovor biti na hrvatskom. Just to say it for... For the people who don't understand Croatian, Serbo Croatian or what not, we can later sit down in a coffee and repeat all of this in a different setting, but since Andrea is more comfortable talking in Croatian, so we'll continue now a bit in Croatian, and then, uh, then eventually uh, we'll tell you everything later on in an informal setting, for those of you who don't understand. <laughs> um, dakle, dobro, dođemo sad možda na koncu i do ovog, uh, i do ovoga, uh, do ovih, uh, do ovog mjesečnika za koji, uh, koji oboj radimo. Um, Dakle, opetovano se zapravo i naglašavalo uh, i sa dijelom i neskrivnom polemičkom intencijom da da LMD, dakle, u Hrvatskoj znači da ona predstavlja jednu drugačiju paradigmu, dakle, novinarstva ili bar pokušaja zapravo da se možda i redefinira sam pojem onoga što je legitimno u novinarstvu, što kao tekstualna forma, što u smislu onoga što se smije zahtjevati od 
od čitateljstva. Dakle, imamo jedan od klasičnih motiva i to je zapravo nešto što se možda provoči kroz cijelu ovu priču, kako je funkcija ekspertnog diskursa, pa onda i kolumniste kao njegovog nekakvog poluge difuzije tog tipa kao ekspertnog neupitnog znanja. Sve to ima određene implikacije po koncept zapravo demokracije ili demokratske debate. S druge strane, mi smo isto imali prigovore da je ovo zapravo isto elitističko glasilo u smislu u smislu da ovo, dakle, način pisanja, obrada teme, do određne mjere, nešto što je često, dakle, hibridna forma između klasičnog reportažnog vrnjarstva i možda više ovih nekakvih teorijskih, akademskih, dakle, formi, da je to, da je to, da je tu, Dakle, elitističko glasilo. Dakle, ono što smo mi tu naglašavali, možda bi ti htjela na to elaborirati malo, a možda i ne moraš, ti ne stavljam riječi u usta, ali ova ideja zapravo emancipacije čitatelja i to bazično povjerenje da čitatelj nije, dakle, ono što je često implicirano kao neka vrsta, rekao bih, prezira prema masama, prezira prema rulji ili gotovo prezira prema uopće ideji, ozbiljno ideji demokratske participacije od ozdob. Dakle, kako ti vidiš tu situaciju u medijima i kontekst ovoga što mi pokušavamo raditi? Da, pa da, mi smo u par navrata nešto govorili o tome više puta, upravo obrnuto od onog što se smatra, dakle, Le Monde nije u tom smislu elitističko glasilo, da pa će približiti znanja, približiti komparativnu analizu sa svih različnih strana svijeta čitateljima, to je nešto potpuno suprotno. Čitatelj je diskvalificirati na način na koji čine to mainstream mediji i još tvrditi da oni sami nisu dovoljno obrazovani da bi tako nešto pratili ili, jel, ono što piše mainstream, pa da se treba uvrtiti u tom krugu, upravo mi se to čini pocinjivanjem čitatelja. Tako da je tu pozicija LMDA, mislim, bitno drugačija. Ali i ono isto što mi se čini da je bitno drugačija i što je mene na kraju krajeva osim samog sadržaja privuklo ovom projektu, to je u istinu taj vlasnički i organizacijski oblik u koji smo se upustili, a to je zadruga, jer do sada stvarno malo koja redakcija u Hrvatskoj proizvodila ona ljeve ili desne novine je imala bilo kakvu vrstu organizacije vlasničke i ostale koja bi odgovarala tom sadržaju. Dakle, svi su smatrali da je dovoljno proizvodila izvodi takav sadržaj, pisat, a sad kakav je vlasnički odnos, da to neće uticati na njihov rad. Što se naravno u svakoj redakciji pokazalo pogrešnim. Zato mi se veoma čini bitnim da imamo ovaj način koji je unaprijed vrlo egalitaran, koji je vrlo demokratičan. Zadruga je jedna nešpekulativna naprosto organizacija i mislim da je to jednako, jednako važno kao i sam sadržaj novina. Dobro. Mi smo sad negdje pri kraju s vremenom, ali bi možda prije nego što, nažalost smo vrlo limitirani vremenski, moramo zapravo u 19.20, 25, bi vjerojatno mi ste trebali krenuti van, možda još sad ako neko ima nekih pitanja ili komentara, bilo da. So, since we are now... We don't have much time left, unfortunately, so, but... If someone has a question or comment to any of the participants here, five more minutes we can spare, I think. Well, concerning the, uh, the topic here, you were discussing that there's not a, uh, there's not much space on uh, on which the mainstream media can focus on uh, during uh, more. Uh, uh, much more time that is uh, than on certain crises. Uh, do you think that maybe because the the public nowadays has a really short attention span, and the media just reflects that on themselves? For example, they might not be interested in um, in uh, long-term aspects of uh, political economy of. Um, Uh, the radical left, the radical right, um, uh, workers' uh, rights and movements, and so uh, so on. Could it be that maybe the in, in some way the public is to also to blame? Uh, this is for me. Oh. 
Okay. Uh, anyway, uh, just a short sentence. Um, I don't think that you know you can kind of um, um, kind of see just in, in a general way a lack of attention or or a lack of interest in some let, let us say more complex uh, problems or topics uh, because uh, you see. The, 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 the fact that uh, the public doesn't have the right information about the economy and the fact that we, let's say here in Croatia, did not uh, debate it, the, 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 more, m the most important issues of the crisis and the austerity measures and so on and so forth, uh, this has certain consequences. You see, uh, consequences in terms of blaming the immigrants or trying to reformulate economic uh, problems in in quasi political terms and so on and so forth. So, uh, whenever you are missing an information or whenever uh, the the debate is not sufficient or uh, whenever the problems are not addressed, you immediately I mean in in the public sphere we immediately see a, a sort of s a direct effect of of the, uh, of that and that is we have this translation of econ a proper economic. Uh, problems into quasi-political terms. And this is not, of course, true just uh, uh, in Croatia. This is true across across the board, uh, across the uh, many nations of Europe. Uh, so if, and I think that, so the lesson to be learned is that if you are not prepared to, as Stipe said, um, uh, um, um, educate your reader or, Im or give him or her uh, tools of uh, his or her uh, own emancipation, you will uh, have a backlash, and that we, and the backlash is of course uh, rise of these of these uh, really um, vulgar themes of uh, immigrants that are uh, stealing our jobs or uh, uh, Greeks that are lazy and are destroying a monetary union and so on and so and so forth. So um, I hate I hate the word, but there is a dialectical relationship. Uh, between between uh, what the media produces and what the public accepts uh, and and kind of reproduces as a as a legitimate uh, as a legitimate content or a, a, as a legitimate uh, issue or, or or a problem and uh, uh, so we when talking about the media and talking about media coverage media representation uh, and all of these things we have to be very careful not to uh, not to uh, fall into this ideological clap trap uh, that is basically uh, uh, founded on, on this idea that uh, there, there are these ignorant masses that simply cannot be educated. This is simply this is simply not true. Uh, uh, and you know, you don't need you don't need an economic crisis to see this. Um, Case study done by uh, by Chomsky and Herman, you know uh, the the political uh, the political economy of the media clearly show that even in the time, uh, even in the, in the in the good times, in the times of prosperity, uh, you have uh, you have re this really um, um, developed apparatus, media apparatus that is trying to you know impose all the necessary illusions so the capitalist reproduction could take place you know properly without any without any. Uh, uh, um, uh, barriers or, or disobedience, and uh, well, that's it. So, thank you, Mislav. Um, we have really promised the people from the Mediatek who are generous enough to, uh, to receive us here that we will uh, would be uh, finished on time. Uh, so this was short. <laughs> no but. So uh, this was short and hopefully, uh, hopefully um, uh, painless. Those who want to debate these issues. Uh, uh, can stay. <laughs> <laughs> can can find some. Well, we can sit down somewhere and, and have a coffee or something and continue this. Yeah. So, uh, thank you again for, for uh, to the participants, uh, uh, to all of you. Uh, uh, thank you, Stipe, for the bilingual uh, presentation. <laughs> and